one Thursday morning in the summer of 2001, I received a telephone call from a godly lady from our church. I'm simply going to call her June. She was about 40 years of age, wonderful relationship with her husband, raised several godly children. All of them have done well. And she said this to me, Pastor Davis, I've been counseling with a young wife and mother whom I'm going to call Hope, who is in a real crisis situation. We're willing to drive there and talk to you if that's possible. Would have been an hour and a half drive they came to our church, but she really desperately needs help today. I said, June, tell me what the problem is. And she said, Hope's husband has told her that he's going to move out when he comes home from work tonight. He's planning to bring a couple of friends with him in a pickup truck and leave her and get a divorce. I said, how long have they been married? She said, about a year. Do they have any children? One little boy, uh, he adores little Marky, I'll call him, and says that he'll support him, but he's tired of being married, says he just doesn't love her anymore, doesn't really want to support her. I said, what's his problem? Why does he want a divorce? All he tells her is he just doesn't love her. He's told her that a lot in the last few weeks. I said, what are the key people around her telling her? She said, the key family members are telling her to leave him. They're telling her that he's no good. She shouldn't have to put up with him. I said, so she's calling you because she really doesn't want a divorce, right? She said, Pastor, I believe she is really desperate and will do anything we tell her to do. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33 is one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible to both husbands and wives, but especially to wives because what he says to husbands in that verse, he's already said once before. Nevertheless, in fact, read this with me out loud, would you please? Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now notice that phrase, the wife see that she reverence her husband. Many times over the last several years, I've counseled with some wife having problems with her husband and I've told her that the solution to her problems is one word and the word, say it, is reverence. Immediately a puzzled look will come across the face of the wife and she will say, and what in the world is reverence? First of all, reverence is the command that balances and gives meaning to submission. In fact, it is really reverence that makes a wife a successful wife. When you stand before God one of these days, wives, if you want to stand there and hear, well done, thou good and faithful wife, you can hear it if you practice this one word. God gives one basic powerful command to husbands in relations to their wives. It, you remember it? It's in Ephesians 5.25 where God said, read it with me men, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now I wish I had time. I've got a brand new entire message on the table on this subject that is a really critical message. We just don't have another service to give it. But it's a really key thought and fellas, you desperately need to practice the truth that is on the screen in front of you. But God it gives, interestingly, two basic powerful commands to wives in relation to their husbands. The first one is found in Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. The second command is the one we already read, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Submission is the place or the position of the wife in God's order for the home. It is not an inferior position. does not mean that she is inferior in any way to her husband. I need an amen right there. Now, the vice president of the United States is not inferior to the president of the United States. He simply has a different position and responsibility. So submission is the place or the position the wife takes Reverence is the practice or the activity of the wife in relation to her husband. It is the primary responsibility or duty she has to fulfill in relation to her husband. Reverence balances and gives meaning to submission. For a wife to submit to her husband without reverencing him would make her submission seem insincere. That in turn could cause him to test her submission by asking her to do something that God forbids them to do. Listen to this paragraph from this particular book, Common Deceptions That Destroy Marriage Oneness. A wife who has a reverent spirit is able to say no to her husband 
when he asks her to do things that are evil and he will respect her for her refusal. However, he will tend to react to a wife who may be submissive on the outside but who lacks a spirit of reverence for him on the inside. Remember this key point. Reverence is the command that balances and gives meaning to submission. Submission is the place or the position for a wife. It is where she ought to be. She is in the co-pilot seat of this airplane. From that seat, she has access to the controls she needs to use. Now, if she's in the pilot seat, she probably won't have access to those controls that God means for her to have. It is the main task, reverence, the practice or activity for wife, it's what she's supposed to be doing. It's the main task that she has to do to make sure that this plane of the home flies properly so that her husband, the pilot, and she, the co-pilot, get their passengers, the children, where they're supposed to go. Now let's ask a question here. Can a lady fly this plane from the pilot's seat? Yes, but if she does, she'll probably fly it alone. She will think that she and her husband are just going to switch seats. She'll be the pilot, he'll be the co-pilot. What is more likely to happen is that when and if she shoves him out of the pilot seat and tells him to go sit in the co-pilot seat, she will instead look over and see the co-pilot seat is empty. And when she goes back in the plane looking for him, she'll find him back with the passengers, the children, and he will be the most difficult passenger on board for her to have to deal with. He may turn into a couch potato or a TV addict. And when a husband gets tired of a wife trying to tell him how to fly the plane or trying to take his pilot seat, and he goes back to sit with the passengers, the children, all the griping, whining, nagging, complaining, and criticizing she can do will probably never get him back into the cockpit. Did you ever hear the term air rage? That's what's happening in this home. So she won't be happy. He won't be happy. And her main job that she needs to do from the co-pilot seat probably won't get done at all. So neither her or her husband are getting the job done they're supposed to do. And the plane might somehow or other still get to its destination but it won't be nearly as smooth a flight as if she had let her husband be in the pilot seat and she had simply sat in the co-pilot seat. Now, have you ever noticed that both in Ephesians 5 and in 1 Peter chapter 3 that the wife is told to submit before the husband is told to love? The wife is first told to submit to her husband. Then the husband is told to love his wife. It's like God is saying something like this. Wives, you need to walk into the cabin first and see the two seats and deliberately take the co-pilot seat. Then you need to look up at your husband and say, you are going to look so good in that seat right there. And I'm going to love being in this seat with the greatest pilot in the world in that seat. And every once in a while, I'm going to get up and give you a neck rub and a back rub and talk about what a great job you're doing flying this plane. And they're going to both think they're in the heavenlies, but especially him. By the way, the answer to problems in the home is not, are you listening, is not for the pilot to try to find a new co-pilot or vice versa. The president and CEO of this airline, the Lord Jesus Christ, has assigned you to your positions. The answer is for each of you to sit in your proper seats and start doing your job. One lady said, I've learned there's very little difference in husbands. You might as well keep the first one. Let's ask another question here. Who is the better of these two people? The smarter these two. It could be either one, and often, if not most of the time, it is the co pilot. Men, 
This has nothing to do with who is the better of the two people. This has to do with where the president of this airline, the Lord Jesus Christ, has asked the two of you to sit and what task he has asked you to perform, that's all. Now let's ask this question. What if this man refuses to sit in his seat and fly this plane? Because I've been asked that before. My husband, he just won't leave. Should the co-pilot switch seats? No. In fact, you know, it comes to mind had a lady who said that to me several times and the truth is she wouldn't let him sit in the pilot seat. She kept telling me, I want him in the co-pilot seat. Or excuse me, I want him in the pilot seat. And a couple of times I had to counsel them and he said, this is what needs to happen. And she said, if you do that, I'll leave you. She didn't even want it at all. Anyway, if she will stay in her seat and do the, her job properly, she's far more likely to be able to get him to sit in the pilot seat and do his job. Yes, Reverence balances and gives meaning to submission. It is also the thing that makes a wife a success as a wife. Yet ladies don't understand submission. There's probably some lady here tonight that think submission is a terrible thing. But you don't get it. Submission is not so much for the husband. Now, reverence is for the husband. But submission is more for your sake, wives, than it is for your husband's sake. What do I mean? It allows you to be in the position where you are able to exercise the greatest power, effectiveness, and influence. And ladies, watch this picture. Ladies have a phenomenal power of influence. Reverence, on the other hand, is what the wife does for her, for her husband. It is what a wife does that benefits her husband the most. More than anything else, reverence motivates a husband. Reverence moves a husband. It builds a husband. It challenges a husband and lifts him and empowers him and encourages him so that he then is much more likely to be able to become what God wants him to be. It is probably the most important thing that a wife does for her husband and at times must be a selfless and sacrificial thing. That means that she ought to do it whether she feels like it or not. Many of the other things that a wife does for a husband will become easier and more fulfilling if she will put them underneath the thought that she is doing all these other things as a means of reverencing her husband. There are things that wives don't like to do. But if she would first think, wait a minute, that, if I do that, is a way for me to reverence my husband and fulfill my position as a wife and my purpose as a wife, those things then would become a lot easier and more meaningful to her. So, secondly, reverence is the activity of a wife esteeming, respecting, admiring, and praising her husband. The Greek word for reverence in Ephesians 5.33 is phobeo and it means awe, fear, fearful, or reverence. Of the 93 times the Greek word occurs in the New Testament, 62 of those times it is translated fear. Coleridge, I think it was Samuel Coleridge said, reverence is the synthesis of love and fear. Reverence is awe. It is deep admiration. It is love of the highest degree. It is regard. It is approval. It is esteem. It is gratefulness. It is honor from the heart. Reverence is devotion. It is adoration. It is respect. It is praise. It is almost every positive thing but worship, which is reserved for God alone. 1 Peter 3 nails this down further and is really a repetition of the command in Ephesians 5.33. Likewise, you wives be in subjection to your own husbands that if any obey not the word, they, uh, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, by the lifestyle of the wife. Men are more seers than they are hearers. Ladies, you've got to remember that thought. Some lady here tonight desperately needs to understand that. A man is won by the conversation of his wife. That's not talking about her mouth doing this. It's talking about her life doing something. 
They see the things that you're doing and they're more likely to be one that way than they are with anything you say with your tongue while they behold. What is it they're going to behold? What is it about this style of life of the wife that is going to cause them to behold and grab their attention? They behold your chaste conversation coupled bound together, your, your way of life bound together with fear and it means reverence. The word fear is the Greek word phobos, which is the root word for phobeo, which was used in Ephesians 5.33. It's virtually the same word, reverence and fear. So here is a wife whose godly way of life is bound together with fearful reverence and respect for her husband, and the Bible says that's the way she wins the husband. A wife who reverences her husband is terribly afraid to not give him the respect that he needs. She would be afraid of doing anything that would disrespect him in any way. Number three, reverence is a wife finding the joy of meeting a need given to her husband by our wise creator. Now, you know, we did not just evolve. We were created. We were made. Now, our wise creator made the wife with a need and he made the husband with a need. The need of a wife given by her creator is for the security and commitment of a husband's love that will also, when he loves her like he ought to, will produce romance for her, which she needs. She needs all that. The commitment, the romance, it's all bound up in that word love. That is the reason that the Bible commands the husband to love his wife twice a husband is commanded to love you. say, well, I just don't love her anymore. Then you just need to get right with God and love her anyway. You say, but I don't feel anything for her. You don't have to feel anything for her. You just love her. That's what it says to do. Now, the need of a husband given by his creator is not primarily for love. This is an area of major confusion for ladies. It's an ma area of major confusion. There's, there's, not, there's not one of the Hollywood crowd that understands this at all. But God, here's what ladies think. I need love, so he needs love. It's not what our creator said. No, the need of a husband given by his creator is not primarily for love, but is for the encouragement and sense of accomplishment that comes from the reverence of his wife. This is probably a husband's greatest need. Now, some women get upset because they say, I reverence in no man. But they wouldn't like it if he said, I ain't going to love no woman. Our creator designed the home he created to be a mutual meeting of needs. How many times over the years has a wife sat in my office and said to me, my husband doesn't love me. And you know if a man really wants to hurt his wife, you know what he says? I don't love you anymore. You've heard it. I mean, he wants to hurt her, that's what he says. Now, ladies, if you ever hear that, you know what you should do? Ignore that he said it and start reverencing him and he's far more likely to stop saying it and start loving you. The, the only way that I know of, biblically speaking, the only power that a wife has to change her husband is this power with reverence. But here they are sitting in the office and she says, he don't love me anymore. And then the husband, he'd been sitting outside. He comes in and sits down maybe. And preacher, it's like they've rehearsed this ahead of time. I've heard it over and over and over again. You have as well. And you know what he says? He says, she doesn't respect me. You see it? He, he doesn't realize, they don't realize that they've both just said that neither one of them are meeting the need that God commanded them to meet. It, but it's almost like they rehearsed it before they walked in the office. And um, he'll say, oh, she doesn't respect me. A wife should not seek her husband's love, but every husband must remember to give it. Isn't that an interesting picture? Did y'all ever see that picture before anywhere? Brother Ramirez, did you see a picture anywhere? Um, <clears throat> a husband should not seek the reverence of his wife, but every wife ought to remember to give it. 
In fact, any time a husband senses a need for his wife's reverence, he should use that sensing of that need as a reminder to express his love and commitment to his wife. And every time a wife senses a need for her husband's love and commitment, she should use that as a reminder to her that she needs to demonstrate reverence to her husband. I'm talking about reverence is a wife finding the joy of meeting a need given to her husband by our wise creator. <laughs> he made us with this need. You know it's amazing the lengths that men will go to to be reverenced. A man will spend lots of time and thousands of dollars to go on a big hunt. He'll buy this gun that he cannot afford and that he'll seldom ever use. But he knows that he's going to hear his buddies say, Wow, look at that gun. That's some gun. He'll travel halfway across the United States or halfway around the world. He'll be so excited he can't sleep, but he won't let anybody know that because he's got to be cool, calm, and collected. He's got to be the mighty hunter who's just very calm about it, you know, just, you know. He'll get up hours before he ordinarily would, get up in a tree stand and sit there in freezing cold weather, and he will pass up a whole herd of deer waiting on that one trophy buck. Some of you guys are drooling looking at that picture. And that trophy buck comes walking along and he'll shoot it and he will track it for hours and when he finally finds it, he gives all the meat away and hangs the head on the wall. Oh, by the way, that's my deer right there just in case you're wondering, all right? <laughs> it, it doesn't matter that there's no longer room to even walk through the living room with those heads on the wall. That head has to be in the most prominent spot in the house or in the office. This really is. Right after I preached this message, I walked into this house in Middletown, Illinois, and I went back, got my camera, and said, here, I'll show you the other one, preacher, look at that. I said, could I come back and take a picture of your house? And he said, sure you can. Now, why does this guy do all of that, all that time, all that money? It's just so he can hear people say five words. You fellas could say them with me. Here's the five words. Did you shoot that buck? Yeah, I shot that buck. It's amazing the lengths that men will go to to be reverenced. You know, a man who runs off with a woman, not his wife, is as sorry and low down as they come. But if he does, you can almost be certain that it was with some woman whom he at least thought appreciated him and reverenced him. I saw a man several years ago. He was man preacher to a beauty queen. I'm serious. She was a knockout. He left her. And he ran off with a lady. And I saw her picture. And it was like, uh, duh. Uh, you know, I don't think I really understood it till I preached this message. I don't think I really got it. It was like, I mean, you know, there's no, no lady's really ugly. God made every, every lady beautiful. But, you know, this, this lady, I mean, she was as close to the edge <laughs> as you've ever seen. And he, oh, come on now. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> anyway, and I couldn't get it. He left the beauty queen and he, I couldn't figure it out. Then I realized that his beauty queen wife was a nagger and a whiner and a complainer. Now, guys, would you look at this lady's picture here, please? All right, I chose that picture on purpose. Because really, as far as the world thinks, that lady is a very attractive lady. But how would you like to be married to her? Is there any man here? It don't matter. She can use all the makeup in the world. Man, how'd you like to come home to that every night? 
this fellow I'm talking about, actually, preacher, I think I, I haven't really told this before, but the fellow I'm talking about was a preacher. And years ago was preaching citywide crusades. He was one of the most powerful and effective preachers with some of the greatest potential I've ever seen. And he wrecked his whole ministry by leaving his wife. What it was was this. He did all this and she didn't see it. And the other woman apparently stepped in and started reverencing a man that she should have left alone. In Proverbs chapter 7, the strange woman used a counterfeit substitute for reverence to lure the simple young man into her house, which the Bible described as the way to hell. Proverbs 7.21 says, With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. You get that? With her much fair speech. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. God said that, not me. The strange woman used flattery, which Proverbs 29.5 says, It's a net spread for your feet. Reverence is more powerful than flattery. Why would a man accept flattery? Because he hadn't gotten any reverence, that's why. He accepts the counterfeit because he hadn't been getting the real thing. The use of reverence is a wife's best way to protect her husband against the dangers of flattery. A lady in our church wisely said, Sometimes I wonder where the church would be today if the men in it were respected as they ought to be by their wives. What power would God unleash through godly men who were respected in their homes? I'm certain that lack of respect and in some cases overt disrespect are holding many men back. Reverence is so powerful that it can virtually turn a man almost any direction. I talked to a lady who told me that she and her husband were both Christians. They'd been married 15 years. She was weeping. She was telling me. And we counseled with him and her husband both. Him and her husband. Him and her both. She was telling me her husband had just been involved in an emotional affair with a lost lady at work. Thank God it went no further than emotions. This lost lady at work was on her third marriage, struggling at home, and the Christian lady, she said this to me, I wrote it down. My husband said to me that he loved me and never really intended to do wrong. He admits he needed to communicate more, which he didn't. He's a bit of an introvert, so he doesn't talk much. Her next sentence is what gave it away. Yet he enjoyed her attention. But I'm afraid my talking may be too much. If he loved me, why did he enjoy her attention? She, you see, she was talking a lot and wondering why he wasn't communicating, but her speech was not including the reverence that was needed that would grab his attention and this other woman started giving it. I said to that wife, the key thing a wife needs to do is give her husband sincere praise every single day. And that lady's attention, though wrong, was like continual fresh praise. If you will give him genuine praise every day, it will draw his heart to you. Well, the ladies in our church who studied this thought, thought extensively said to me, Brother Davis, I don't want my husband to live and die and not get from me what God means for me to give to him. One of the reasons God made man was that God wanted to be reverenced and worshipped. And certainly man is not God. But he was made in God's image and there is a definite area of comparison here. What is the worst thing that you and I can do? Violate the first commandment. What does it say? Read it. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. The worst thing you can do is put another God before the Lord. That's as bad as it gets. And what is the worst thing that a wife can do? Reverence any man more than her husband. Listen, listen to me, listen to me. Don't ever go home from church and say, Honey, I wish you were more like Brother So-and-so who's such a godly man in our church. You will cause your husband to not want to go to church ever again. You will not move him the direction you want to. You just said to him, I reverence him more than I reverence you. You had just violated the number one command for a wife not to violate. 
What is the worst thing a wife can do? Reverence any man more than a husband. One of the greatest dangers of a wife working a job, and I'm not totally against that, but one of the worst dangers of a wife working a job is that men will do all sorts of things just to be reverenced. Many ladies have been deceived and led into sin by such things. The Bible little story that illustrates how much men want to be reverenced and honored is found in Esther chapter 1. It's almost humorous in that book how much men want to be reverenced. Ahasuerus, who was called Xerxes in most history books, was one of those most wealthy and powerful men to ever live in the history of the world. And according to verse 1 of Esther 1, he ruled 127 provinces all the way from India to Ethiopia. The ruins of the buildings, I've got actual pictures here now for you, watch them. The ruins of the buildings that Hashirus built at Shushan can still be seen 150 miles north of the Persian Gulf. Ahasuerus' father, Darius, had built a fabulous palace, but Ahasuerus was not satisfied with that fabulous palace and wanted to build his own buildings. He built what was known in the ancient world as the Propylia. It was a lavish entrance building to the platform of the palaces that stood 90 feet tall. That's as tall as the very tip top of our steeple. There's our building in Illinois. Uh, and the steeple on that building is 90 feet tall. And that, that palace, on, that was 90 feet tall. It was probably breathtaking in its beauty. This man also built one of the most unusual throne rooms of any king in history. It was called the Hypostyle Hall of 100 Columns. This visible expression of the grandeur, wealth, and power of a king who ruled over millions of people enabled him to present himself to his subjects with a majesty only known by an ancient king. The lavish, ornate ceiling in that place was just one indicator. Look at that ceiling. Where have you ever seen a ceiling that ornate? This, uh, this, it, it was... Um, an indicator of how impressive this throne room was and how much Ahasuerus wanted to be reverenced. Esther chapter 1, he called for Queen Vashti to come and show her beauty to the princes and people at the king's feast. Exactly what that means, nobody really knows for sure. Maybe it was something wrong, maybe it was not. All we know is that Vashti refused to come before King Ahasuerus. And suddenly, you know what? All his buildings and wealth meant nothing. Because the one person on the face of the earth that meant something as far as him being reverenced did not give reverence. And the Bible says that he became very wroth. And not only became very angry, he called his wise men in and said, what am I supposed to do to this with this? And Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the, king, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes. We're taking up an offense here. Your wife didn't reverence you. And all the people that are in all the provinces the king has years for this deed of the queen shall come abroad to all women. What's going to happen to all the women? Millions of them all over this province. The most terrible thing they can imagine could happen. They shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king has years commanded Vashti the king to be, queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when this gets reported? I mean, it's going to spread like a plague through the kingdom, Mr. King. I mean, the ladies all over this kingdom are going to despise their husband, and we can't imagine anything worse that could happen. Now, you know, this would almost be humorous if it hadn't really happened in history, folks. Here it is. Verse 19, they said, here's what we got to do if it please the king. Let there go a royal commandment from him and let it be written among the laws and the Medes and the Persians that it be altered not. This is a law that can never be changed that Vashti come no more before the king Ahasuerus and let the king give her royal state unto another that is better than she. Obviously, she had once what she's supposed to be. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, all the wives, what's going to happen? They said, we'll be able to breathe a sigh of relief. All the wives shall give to their husbands honor both the great and small big men Important men, little men, unimportant men, their wives will give them reverence and honor. And the saying pleased the king and the prince. The king did that and sent letters all over the province. Here's people going everywhere carrying these letters from the king. What's it all about? It's a command. you got to honor your husbands. 
It's incredible. A king issues a royal decree and sends it everywhere just to make sure husbands in his kingdom get honored. I said to June, you don't need to drive here. I'll tell you the key principle that hope needs to use. You'll see it right away and communicate it to her as well or better than myself. Though, though the, the Bible talks about the older women teaching the younger women to love their husbands. By the way, that's not the same Greek word that's used in the other passage. This is, this is the, the love that is uh, just a, a friendship kind of a love. And um, I said, I really feel like this lady could tell this other lady far better than I could. I said, June, the key element or principle that hope needs to use with Joe is reverence. Then I explained what reverence was and told her what hope needed to do. I told her that hope had to do everything we told her to do and especially she must not do what we tell her not to do. I said, June, there is no way any of us can predict what this man is going to do, but at least this wife will have had the satisfaction of knowing she tried, and I promise you the husband will never forget or get away from what this wife does if she does what we tell her to do. Read the points with me, would you please, everybody? Number one, reverence is the command that balances and gives meaning to submission. Number two, Reverence is the activity of a wife esteeming, respecting, admiring, and praising her husband. Number three, reverence is a wife finding the joy of meeting a need given to her husband by our wise creator. Now we need to ask a second question. What is not reverence? Because if you give reverence, ladies, and yet you do the things that don't give reverence, you will cancel out the reverence. What is the opposite of reverence? What is it that a wife must make sure that she never does or she will break God's command to reverence her husband and she will make herself a failure as a wife? She might still succeed as a mother. She will be a failure as a wife. Here it is. Correcting, complaining, criticizing, and nagging is not reverence. I preached, there's a message on the table called the attitude no lady should have. I call it the Martha attitude because you check the passages in the New Testament where Martha was speaking and you'll see that in virtually every passage where Martha was speaking, almost every time she spoke, she was correcting or criticizing Jesus himself. Check it out. Jesus, Mary needs to get busy and help me in the kitchen. Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. Now, some husbands will start to tell a story. He'll say, we were in Monterey Park the other day, and his wife will interrupt and say, no, honey, we were in Los Angeles. He'll try again. He'll say, anyway, we were in Los Angeles last Monday. She'll interrupt and say, no, honey, it was last Tuesday. One final time he'll try. Okay, last Tuesday, we were in Los Angeles, and I said, and she interrupts again and says, no, you didn't talk first, I did. Her poor husband will throw up his hands and say, you tell the story. And she'll say, no, I just want you to tell it right. Now, ladies, can I show you a picture of what you look like when you do that? Hold on to your seat. There it is. That's what you, I don't care how beautiful you are. I don't care how much makeup you use. I don't care how expensive your clothes and your jewelry are. That's what you look like to your husband and everybody else. Now, you know what you just did? You might be in the co-pilot seat, but you're not using the controls you're supposed to be using. You're using different controls, and everybody standing around listening is thinking to themselves, who cares whether it was Monterey Park or Los Angeles? Who cares whether it was Monday or Tuesday? I saw a sign in a craft store. It said this, behind every great man is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me here, ladies. I'm not saying a wife should never correct her husband. There are times we need correction. I am saying that the only one who usually cares about all those little trivial corrections is the corrector herself. Everybody else is embarrassed for you and him both. I saw a picture of a lady's sweatshirt that had a slogan written on the front of it. It said, if a man speaks in the forest and there's no woman there to hear him, is he still wrong? <laughs> Correcting, complaining, and criticizing is the opposite of reverence. 
Somebody said a wife questioning your husband is often like correcting him. Ladies, when your husband gets a job done around the house, don't say, well, it's about time. Say, wow, that is so nice. My husband is the best repairman in the whole wide world. Tell me how you did that, honey. You know what he'll probably do? He'll probably stand there and tell you all the details about it. And the next time you want to talk to him about something, he's more likely to listen to your details. Maybe your husband is not a decision maker. Maybe he's always saying to the children those words that a good mother doesn't like to hear. Go ask your mama. Do not look at your husband and say, when are you ever going to be a man and make up your mind? Say, Honey, I admire you so much and I want to please you so badly. Would you please tell me what to do so I can make sure it pleases you? Now, this may not always be true, but it's really possible that a man who's always working on the neighbor's house, y'all know anybody like that? Don't, don't, don't anybody poke each other now, okay? The guy who's always working on the neighbor's house and the wife is always complaining and griping and criticizing, saying he's always at somebody else's house. He never works on our house. Our house is falling apart. It may be that he's being reverenced by the neighbors but not by his wife. It may be that the neighbors are grateful but his wife is a complainer and a nagger and a criticizer and isn't grateful no matter what he does. One reason many ladies have a problem with criticizing their husbands. Now get ready for this. I need to take a drink of water right here. All right. Sorry, but that really does help my voice. One reason many ladies have a problem with criticizing their husband is because men often do gross things. They belch. They pick their nose. They spit in the sink. They lick their plate. They slurp. Then they laugh about it. I don't need to tell any more things they do, do I? <laughs> and it is so difficult for a delicate emotional, the Bible refers to the lady as the weaker vessel, delicate emotional lady who admires and appreciates beauty to admire a husband who is continually doing gross stuff. I make no defense for gross men, ladies. And yet, the Bible does not say the wife see that she reverence her husband unless he is gross. It's not there. Have you found it? I can't find it either. Mothers, did you know that the way your children think about their father is probably based to a great extent on what they hear you say about him? That he's either a wonderful man or he's a good-for-nothing bum. You create that image in your children's minds. Perhaps the worst form of disrespect a wife can exhibit toward her husband is not correcting, not criticizing, not complaining, but nagging. One of the worst things of all a wife can do is nag her husband. Nagging is a scud missile for which there is never been, never has been made a patriot missile to blow it up before it hits the man. It just comes in and blows him up. I saw a sign in a craft shop that might help some ladies. Maybe you ought to get that and put it up in your home somewhere. Absolutely no nagging. There is not a man in this world that can stand a nagging woman. Yak, 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 da, 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 da. How bad I've asked you to fix that screen door 80 times. Yak, 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 yak. Nancy's husband fixed their screen door that they broke and that Sally's husband keeps their lawn perfect and our, heart, our yard looks like a jungle and your dirty underwear were left on the floor again this morning. Your socks were in the bathroom and all you ever do is eat and sleep and read the newspaper and watch TV and yak, 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 yak. Wow. 
Ladies, you can either praise your husband for what he does do or you can nag him for what he doesn't do. But you will never motivate him with nagging. I've seen some ladies, you'd think their daddy was an auctioneer and they got vaccinated with a phonograph needle. <laughs> Somebody said a man who is married to a nag lives a horse's life. And the Bible says that a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman. How'd you like to be married to her? There it is. A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Have you ever had a drip in the bathroom sink and you lay down at night and it goes? Drip, 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 drip. You say, I'm tired of that. Oh, imagine how tired somebody else could be. You know my ladies nag their husbands because they see some something or some things in their husband they want to change. What they don't realize is it won't work. Nagging will either, look at the pictures, make your husband angry, drive him crazy, destroy his spirit, or all three. Seldom, if ever, does it change him unless it changes him into something you wouldn't like anyway. I have seen that happen. We describe what reverence is. We've told what reverence is not. Now, what are ways for a wife to show reverence to her husband? How can you reverence your husband? Watch him. Listen to him. Admire him. Compliment him. Praise him. Love him. Teach your children to respect him. Teach the children to be excited about daddy coming home. Don't greet daddy at the door with a list of problems and complaints. Keep the house clean. Create a peaceful atmosphere at home. Joyfully carry out his wishes. Express appreciation to him. Love him. Fix his favorite foods. Be loyal to him in every powerful sense of the word loyalty. Expect nothing in return. Let God take care of the results. Write him notes or letters. I got an email this afternoon from my wife. It's the honest truth. I've been married 41 and a half years. I sat there and just, I felt a tingling all over my body reading that email from my wife this afternoon. I, I can't describe it to you. I miss her something awful. I don't travel without her hardly ever anymore. And my wife gave me a card several years ago. I kept the card. It's like I couldn't throw it away. Later I realized why. It was because the very words of the card itself were words of reverence that touched me at the deepest level. Now ladies, the weightiness of the next sentence deserves 15 to 20 minutes of preaching. But all I can do in this crowd tonight is just say it and go on but it really is one-fourth of this message. And I can only give it in one sentence. Don't miss it. And that is help develop and praise his intimacy skills. Something incredibly important about that, put several stars next to it. Admire the work that he does, whatever it is. Have you noticed that a man will do a job? Maybe he'll repair something that's broken. Maybe he'll build something. Maybe he just mows the lawn. When he gets done, he'll stand back and admire it. Then he'll go do something else and come back later and admire it some more. Then he'll come to his wife. In fact, this right here is the way that for years I would describe reverence when I only had one minute to describe it to somebody. Uh, he'll come to his wife and he'll say, uh, Honey, I just finished mowing the yard. Ladies, can I tell you something? One of the dumbest things you ever did right then is say, that's nice. You don't get it. That's his masterpiece out there. 
He just created a work of art out there. He worked on it for hours. He was sweating. He was dirty. And he came in to tell you that. And here's what you're supposed to say. You did. Honey, just a minute. I want to come and see it. Then you stand there. And you say, nobody can mow a yard like you can mow it. It just looks so good. Guys, I'm, ladies, I'm the one who preaches this, all right? My wife's heard me tell this over and over and over and over again. It still works on me. Several months ago, I've never forgotten it. We're driving up the driveway. I'd mowed the lawn. And she said, you know, sometimes other, our son-in-laws come over and mow the lawn. The grandsons mow the lawn. Honey, nobody mows the lawn like you do. That crazy or what? And I'm sitting there saying to myself, Keep yourself calm, sir. <laughs> Don't get excited about it. Don't expect it. Don't expect it. You see, but, but your husband does something, then you're too busy to take notice of it. You know what you just did? You lost your opportunity to succeed as a wife. That was your great chance. Um, a wife builds her husband. That's the reason the Bible talks about a woman Building, I'm skipping over a couple of things here. Building her house or tearing it down. Ladies, that's the way you do it. You reverence your husband. You build your house. You either rip your house down one brick at a time with your hands or you're building it. A man's identity as a person is so interwoven with the work that he does that to reverence his work is almost the same as reverencing him. His identity as a person is tied in with his work. Genesis 2, God made a garden made Adam to dress it and keep it. Then he made Eve. Why did he make Eve? So there was somebody who'd stand there and say, boy, you're doing a beautiful job of that garden. A lady wrote an advice column and she said, my husband lost his position as an executive. Every day I went to work while he struggled to find a job that would give him the income and the time to which he was accustomed. I grew resentful and worried. He refused to take any job that wasn't up to his prior standards. I asked him what he would do if his family was in a rowboat that had sprung a leak. Would he just sit by and let us drown? Of course not. I let him know I had complete confidence in him and loved him and would not mention it again. The next day he found a job driving a limousine. He learned he was valued by me, his friends, and his family for who he is and not the title after his name. He learned that all honest work has value. He learned that everyone should be treated with dignity and respect and that was 15 years ago and not a day goes by without me telling him how I admire him. A man's fulfillment in life is not known just by the work that he does his fulfillment in life comes when he, his wife says, Honey, that's a great job. I love it. Do you know how many times a pastor, sister pastor, comes home discouraged? You know, you walk in the pulpit, you're always up. Don't matter what it is. You know it's right to be up. Preacher, I suspect it's true of you. I would not have been pastor at Park Meadows, been Lincoln, Park Meadows Baptist Church in Lincoln, Illinois. I'll be honest with you. I would not have survived for 36 years without a wife that when I came home dragging did not look at me and say, Honey, we've been there before. We'll be there again, but we're going to make it. You can do it. You can do it. And suddenly... Something inside, it didn't matter what anybody else said. There could have been a dozen men who were crawling all over me, telling me all the bad things and everything, and suddenly I couldn't make it again. One of the most destructive things. My, my wife has been such an encourager so many times. One of the most destructive things I know of is for a wife to become discontent or critical when a husband is truly trying and yet is having difficulty making ends meet. Now, I need to balance this just a little bit. I'm almost done. Do you know why some ladies don't reverence their husbands? Listen to me carefully. Because he believes it when you do. 
And his head is already as big as a basketball and you know it has to be your calling in life to keep it from getting as big as a beach ball. Now, this message is as important for men as it is for ladies. You must know what to do with reverence, fellas. It is a form of praise. One of two things happens with praise. It either purifies you or it puffs you up and makes you proud. The Bible says the finding pot for silver, the furnace for gold. So as a man to his praise, what does the finding pot do when the master craftsman is making silver? It burns out the dross. So you must let the praise burn out the dross of your laziness, your self-centeredness, and your pride, fellas. You must say to yourself, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, so it has to be her love and kindness and the Lord's wisdom and graciousness giving this to me. When she compliments you, you say, honey, you're just such a wonderful encourager to me. You admire and appreciate and thank your wife for her praise. You pass the pure silver along to the Lord because if anything good comes out of our lives, it has to come because of him anyway. I told June that Hope needed to clean the house from top to bottom. Listen to me now. This husband coming home about to move out doesn't need to walk through a mess to do it. Everything about that house needed to look absolutely perfect when her husband walked in. A messy house, especially dirty floors or dirty dishes piled up, tends to mess up a man's spirit and turn him into a grouch. The next thing she needed to do was cook her husband's favorite meal. Have it ready, let the aroma be filling the house when he comes walking in. She should also fix enough for his friends coming to help him move. She herself should be pleasant, upbeat, sweet, positive, nice, and attractive. She should plan and speak sincere words of praise and appreciation. She needs to think of his positive character qualities and praise him for them in the presence of the other guys. I said to June, we might not be able to stop him from moving out, but we'd like to create such an atmosphere that his buddies, after he moves out, look at him and say, what kind of idiot are you for leaving her? The most important thing is what she must not do. She'll be tempted to do it. She must not whine, cry, complain, criticize, or nag. I said, June, tell her she must not nag. She must not nag. She must not nag. She must not nag. She must not complain. Her spirit must not communicate anything but gratefulness, love, appreciation, and reverence. Teach her this, June. You know how to do it. That's why your home is what it is. You communicate this to her. She needs to remember things he's done that he felt good about and talk about those things. Very important. She needs to tell him or write him a letter praising his skills when they are alone together. She also needs to get a babysitter for the little boy. Marky himself doesn't need to be in an atmosphere where dad is moving out. Plus, she doesn't need the distraction of the baby. And we sure cannot take a chance on Satan pinching that baby and making him cry all night long. Before 6.30 that night, Hope was ready. The home was spick and span clean. She herself dressed nicely, hair fixed, looked great. The meal was ready and the house was filled with the aroma of Joe's favorite meal. 6.30 came in. Joe wasn't home. 7 o'clock, not home. 7.30, 8 o'clock, 8.30, 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10.30. 11 o'clock, still not home. She called June and she said, he's not home. What do I do? She was tired. She sat down on the bed, fell asleep a little after two in the morning. Joe came home by himself. He found and read the letter sitting on the counter she had written to my wonderful husband. I'm so grateful to have a husband like you. You're a wonderful husband, provider, lover, and friend. I trust you in so many ways as a counselor and in making the right decision. And the next two sentences are too personal to read publicly but are a very important part of the letter. She continued, after God, you're my life. I'm not writing this to change your mind. I'm just writing this to let you know how wonderfully appreciated you are to me. I pray God will bless you fully in whatever you do. I love you always and forever. And she signed your loving wife and used a nickname that they had used before. He's in the house reading the letter. She's asleep. He went in, took a shower, woke her up with the noise of the shower. Then he walked in, was looking in the refrigerator for something to eat. She welcomed him home, told him what she had fixed. He commented about how nice the house looked and how nice she looked. He asked why the other dishes were in the refrigerator, and she told him she fixed them for his friends who were coming to help him move out. She warmed the food. Then she sat and smiled and praised him, reverenced him, and talked to him while they ate. He told her she looked awfully nice, so maybe she should just go back to bed. She She said, well, you know, we are still married. The next morning, she got up and fixed him breakfast. And on the way out the door, she gave him a letter from his one-year-old son, an emotional word picture showing Daddy how his son was probably feeling in the spirit with Daddy moving out. And the letter wound up by saying, from the little boy, 
less than a year old. Obviously, mom had to write it. I wish you knew how much I love you and how my whole life is in your hands. Only Jesus and mommy love you more than I do. I love you and miss you. His name. He read it without comment, put it in his pocket, headed out the door. She stood on the porch smiling and waving by to him and he was so distracted as he was watching her as he was backing out that he almost ran over something while he's backing out. She giggled him, threw him a kiss. Over the next several days, he continued to mention divorce. She just continued reverencing. June had to encourage her several times not to give up. Another letter came from the little boy. A few months after this wife changed, they were still together. Her husband was in a bad traffic accident. He went to sleep at the wheel of the car, went through a traffic light, hit another vehicle, was in the hospital over two weeks. While he was in the hospital, he gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Started taking his family to church. I checked on them just a few weeks ago, and this has been 10, 12 years ago. They're still together, still serving God by the grace of God. Don't ever forget the most important thing every husband needs is a godly life, wife and that begins with being born again and the most important thing every wife needs is a godly husband and that begins with being born again. Have you been born again? Are you allowing the Lord Jesus to work in your life? Would you bow with me please?